It is the largest bust of its kind in Texas history. Last night, officials from five Dallas area law enforcement agencies broke up the state's biggest dogfight. John Jones has details. For years, police and sheriff's deputies in Dallas County have been trying to put an end to the vicious sport of dogfighting. But despite their efforts, dogfighters have managed to stay one step ahead of the law. Acting on a tip, Agents from the Greater Dallas Area Organized Crime Task Force surrounded an illegal pit. Dallas's police helicopter flew overhead, flushing people out of the woods. One by one, they came out. 56 in all, yet others got away. Still, officials say it's the biggest dogfighting bust in county history. What they couldn't hide was the pit. Organizers strung power cords from a nearby house to light the crude arena. Tarps were put up to shield light from the street. Buckets of water used to wipe down the bloodied animals were scattered by people as they ran. They even had a mini concession stand. And nearby, a scale for weighing the fighters. People came to this fight from as far away as Missouri and Oklahoma. At stake, thousands of dollars to be won in a bloody high stakes game of life and death. Investigators say the winner of the first fight would get $2,500. The two surviving dogs were to battle it out in a Grand Slam fight worth $10,000. The dogs were released along with their owners. For now, the law has won a battle in its war against dog fighting. But despite the success of the raid, officials admit that these dogs have lived to fight again. 54 people received only tickets for attending that fight. One other was charged with a felony, but authorities say they will seek more felony charges. Authorities in Arcadia, Florida, have completed their on-the-scene investigation of the house fire that drove the Ray family and their three AIDS-exposed sons out of town. The sheriff says there's no evidence a firebomb started the suspicious blaze. The family received death threats last week when a judge ordered the three sons to be allowed to return to school. Many schools across the country are struggling with the question of AIDS education. Tim Eulinger reports there are no easy answers. School officials across the country are reviewing material for AIDS education courses. I never really understood this AIDS stuff. I don't believe you, you will. We do also want them to have some detailed information uh, about how AIDS is uh, passed from one person to another. The nation's largest teachers union, the National Education Association, feels AIDS education, even for young students, is highly important. Because we're no longer talking about the potential of pregnancy. We're talking about the potential of death. But the NEA and other large national groups, such as the PTA, say the development of AIDS education programs is up to the local community. As with all curriculum decisions, the PTA feels that those decisions have to be made at the local level. What's right for one community may not be right for the other community. That community standards may differ is apparent when looking at some of the videotapes being used to teach students about AIDS prevention. This video will be shown in New York City schools. The point is, if you're going to have sexual intercourse of any kind, use a condom. But a videotape that may appeal to more conservative school boards says there's really no such thing as safe sex. This program advocates sexual abstinence as the only reasonable means of dealing with AIDS at this time. And school boards differ on when to begin AIDS prevention classes. In New York State, a controversial plan to recommend AIDS education beginning in kindergarten is under consideration. But in many other areas of the country, AIDS education for very young students is not being discussed. I would prefer to wait and see the uh, student involvement, the student reaction and response to uh, learning as early as the fifth grade level uh, before determining to go even lower in the curriculum. Educators say there's been a movement in just the last year or so to fight AIDS through education. And people are beginning to realize that if you don't start to talk about these issues, Maybe what you're really going to have to deal with more and more in schools is death and dying. Tim Ullinger, CNN, New York. The children of women exposed to the flu during the second three months of pregnancy may be more likely to develop schizophrenia. That's according to a study released today at the New York Psychological Convention. Meningitis, an infection of the brain lining, is one of the leading causes of deafness in children. Researchers say a vaccine may now prevent 100 such cases a year. Carol Cook reports. Mervyn Garrison grew up on a ranch in Wyoming. Nearly 60 years ago, a bout of spinal meningitis left him profoundly deaf. I remember that 
period of time very clearly because it was there was an awful electrical storm that night. I developed a bad cold and a high fever, and my mother was frightened. Then she took me to the hospital. It was 40 miles away on a gravel road. In 1985, federal officials approved a vaccine against H flu type meningitis. Now health experts say it's up to parents to get their children immunized. Particularly those in high risk groups, uh, those in daycare, where they're more exposed to, uh, to the H uh, flu organism. But uh, uh, really, it would seem that every, every uh, toddler uh, should, be, should be vaccinated. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that all children be vaccinated at age two. But officials estimate that fewer than half the children in this country get the vaccine. In a study of meningitis-related deafness conducted by Wolf and Dr. Scott Brown, the two found that vaccination is particularly important for blacks, since they run a higher risk of contracting meningitis. The difference is about 40 kids per 100,000 which doesn't seem like a lot, but when taken across the entire country, it means a lot of black kids can get the disease. Brown says less access to good medical care is a key reason for the racial difference. Right now, the vaccine is only effective in children age two or older, but most meningitis-related hearing loss happens before that, so researchers are working on a vaccine for infants as young as 12 months. Carol Cook, CNN, Washington. Headline Sports is next. Headline news on WTTW will continue. Beyond Excellence, the Super Achievers, takes you behind the scenes to observe five extraordinary business visionaries creating a bright new chapter in the history of American business. Mitchell Kapor, founder of Lotus, the largest software company in the industry. Lane Nimeth of Discovery Toys. Doug Tompkins of Esprit. Fred Smith, the founder and charismatic leader of Federal Express, and Stephen Jobs, formerly of Apple Computer and founder of Next Incorporated. I think we ought to spend 100% of our time thinking about that, and if we can't do that, then we ought to go broke. Who are these superstars of American business in the 1980s? What drives them in relentless pursuit of their business visions, and what allows them to achieve? The Super Achievers, an intimate portrait of America's new business heroes in action from the producers of In Search of Excellence. Meet the new business heroes, Wednesday at 8. On the next South American journey, the Carnival. It's a celebration of such magnitude that it's rivaled by few in the world. It seemed monstrously extravagant. They were blowing $100 a bottle on champagne. It seemed like an insult to the poor. But then I remembered that over in Mangera, Carnival would make them spend and spend as well. Carnival was madness. But however crazy it was, I was hooked. I wanted to be in it. But the origins of this party are far removed from the glitz and glamour of the festival. Join us for all the sights and sounds of the world's biggest party, the Carnival on the next South American Journey. Join us for another South American Journey, Friday at 9. It's 49 minutes past the hour. Here's the latest from Headline Sports. I'm Tom West, Headline Sports. Well, you can call him the streak. Canada's Ben Johnson flew past Carl Lewis and the 100-meter world record Sunday, setting a new standard of 9.83 seconds at the track and field championships in Rome. Minnesota's Kirby Puckett also had an enviable weekend in Milwaukee. Four for five with two homers Saturday, six for six with two homers Sunday. For good measure, he even threw in a leaping catch to rob Robin Young of a grand slam. The Twins beat the Brewers 10 to six and took the lead in the AL West by a game over Oakland. The A's were having their own problems with a slugger. Toronto's George Bell hit his 40th and 41st homers in the Blue Jays' 13 to three route. That keeps them one game behind Detroit in the East Division. Texas catcher Gino Petralli tied a dubious Major League mark with six pass balls, and the Tigers shut out the Rangers 7-0 behind Doyle Alexander's three-hitter. 
In Chicago, Kansas City's Kevin Seitzer hit a grand slam in the Royals' 11-7 win, and new manager John Wathen has won three out of four. Pitcher Bill Gullickson's AL debut brought the Yankees a win. Dwight Evans backed Boston with two homers, and Angels pitcher Don Sutton got his 319th career win. In the National League, St. Louis scored its 44th come-from-behind victory. Jose Akendo laid down the suicide squeeze with one out in the bottom of the ninth. Jack Clark came across, and the Cards beat the Braves 4-3. They still lead second place Montreal by five games, even though the Expos have won five in a row. Wallace Johnson's two-run pinch hit double in the ninth gave Montreal a 5-4 win at Los Angeles. The Pirates' Doug Drabeck shut out Houston. It was the Cubs downing the Reds, Andre Dawson with his 43rd homer. The Padres beat the Phillies and the Mets down the Giants. A few more deals were struck by the contenders on Sunday. The Royals got reliever Gene Garber from Atlanta for a player to be named later. The Cards traded lefty reliever Pat Perry to Cincinnati for a player to be named later. And San Diego sent right-handed pitcher Storm Davis to Oakland for two players to be named later. The college football season's underway. This 20-yard field goal by Tennessee's Phil Rich with three seconds to go gave the 20th-ranked Volunteers a 23-22 win over number 14, Iowa. Curtis Strange has set a one-year earnings record after picking up the $144,000 first prize at the World Series of Golf. Strange has earned over $697,000 this year. Tom West, Headline Sports. I'm Don Harrison, and here's what's hot. Chicago's Stan Makita Hockey School for the Hearing Impaired has been going strong for 14 years. There's no patronizing. The kids learn real hockey, and the parents love it. It gives them a, a, a self-image and self-confidence about themselves. Stan Makita himself says it's good for building character. The objective is to be better useful citizens to society and to uh, make, make better, uh, better life for themselves. I'm Don Harrison. Headline News. In the headlines, three, two, one. The redesigned space shuttle booster underwent its first full-scale test firing this afternoon. Test results are due in two weeks. In Boston today, a sniper shot at least five people to death before taking his own life. And a new convoy of reflayed Kuwaiti oil tankers, the sixth to fly the Stars and Stripes, entered the Persian Gulf today. For the top stories, I'm Brad Johnson. More news after this. More headline news in a minute, here on 11. I went from hotshot lawyer to cocaine addict. And I didn't just ruin myself. I spread disaster among my family, friends, and business. I stole for cocaine. See, cocaine torments you till you do anything to get it. When I was doing cocaine, I got so selfish. I wish I didn't have no one. No kids, no parents, no people who love me. I don't know how I got there, but I sold everything for cocaine. Took away my self-esteem. For years, I denied the addiction until the money was gone and my jet-set life totally blown away. Anyone that says cocaine's not addictive, they lie. When you do cocaine, you lie to yourself about being in control. Cocaine's not hip, it's hype. Anyone who tells you it's okay, is a liar. In Illinois, call 1-800-445-COKE. The home video industry is being pressured to adopt the movie industry's rating system. Bill Tush has this dollars and cents report. Until recently, the nation's more than 50,000 video outlets have not been required to rate home videos. That's cause for concern among parents. If a child is allowed to come into a place like this and get a tape out, they should have ratings on them because I don't think children should be allowed to see so many. There are so many films here. I would say about at least nine-tenths of them have violence in them. A few times I had to watch the movie first and then uh, make sure it was all right for my children to see because the back had nothing as a PG or R or anything like that. A majority of films put out on the home video market are scrutinized under the same conditions used by the Motion Picture Association of America. Well, the movie rating system is working. Uh, the very act of survival of for 19 years is evidence that it works. Uh, so I think that uh, it would be very simple uh, if the Video Dealer Association 
simply uh, adopted the motion picture rating system. Valenti estimates that 98% of home videos have passed through the association's rating system. Those ratings are often displayed on the boxes, but when they are not, they are put on marked shelves. You, you have a definite responsibility as, as, as a retailer to, to ensure that, that, that kids are not being exposed to the kind of material that would be heavily questionable. Legislation already is pending in four states, Tennessee, Illinois, Maryland, and Georgia, making it illegal to sell or rent R and X-rated films to kids under 17 without a parent. Apparently, those states feel the threat of criminal prosecution is stronger than simply requesting video retailers to turn away juveniles. Bill Tosh, CNN, New York. Horseback riding takes on special meeting for a group of handicapped kids in Michigan. Brenda Garten reports. This won't take long. We've got lots of help today. Okay. Preparing to ride a horse for competition is no easy task. Making sure the horse is groomed, the equipment is on properly, and the routine is mastered. Walk on. It's even more difficult if the rider is handicapped. It's just an exciting thing to see kids that don't have any other opportunities uh, finally come down here and, and get a chance to do what anybody else, anybody else can do and get, the, get those ribbons and hear that applause. Bill Schumacher helps run the Kent County Special Riding Program. Because of his school, students like Marjorie are competing for blue ribbons at the Kent County 4-H Youth Mar Fair. When Marjorie first started riding 11 years ago, she didn't know a thing about horses. Now they're all she talks about. Put blankets, set on, that kind of stuff. It's that kind of stuff that makes Marjorie's mom proud. Oh, she's just got so much more self-confidence in her, and she says, hey, this is something I could do that she never thought she could do. The mentally impaired riders become different people when they're in the saddle. Volunteers told me a story about an autistic boy a couple of years ago who hadn't spoken a word in his life. But one day he told his horse to walk. We've got a lot of kids that are considered um, recluses or, and they don't speak, they don't socialize, and they come out and this horse is a big deal to them. These four mentally impaired riders aren't just competing for ribbons. They're proving to themselves, family, and friends that they can ride over obstacles standing in their way. In Kent County, Michigan, Brenda Garten reporting for CNN. That's our report this half hour. Thanks a lot for joining us. I'm Brian Christie, Around the World in 30 Minutes. This is Headline News.